One of the things that make us who we are is how we look. You got your daddy's eyes. You got your mama's mouth. You walk like your grandfather. Your voice sounds like so-and-so, your uncle. These physical attributes. We inherit these from our ancestors. This is part of our identity. Pull out the driver's license, they say that you're this tall, with this color eyes, this color hair. This is all part of your identity. These are those physical attributes that give you an identity and let you know who you are and differentiate you from others. But this is only a part of it. Psychological markers can also be spiritual, we can also say, because these guys are concerned with doing psychological and spiritual characteristics also make us who we are and add to our self-concept. And as well as, as well as social attributes, this means the influences of the society around us also identify us. You're not just who you are, you're not just you as an individual, but just as an example, by attending this center tonight, you're affiliated with this group. You, part of your identity is that you attend this center with this group of people in this area. So your social affiliations also are part of your identity. So these things all add up to a person's self-concept, inshallah. Send us out of please. Now what about identity formation, which was also mentioned in our definition? What is this process of identity formation? I'll summarize it for you real quick before I read the official definition. Identity formation is this, that early in your life, and some of these experts, they say by age three, your identity is, the foundation of that identity is formed. But identity formation means that this is an ongoing pro pro process. That throughout your life, your identity develops. As an example, any of us in here, when we were 18, we believed certain things, we did certain things that we no longer believe or do anymore. When we were 18 years old, we thought that working out and doing a lot of push-ups and a lot of pull-ups would get us a good life. We very quickly realized that this doesn't work. Ladies are interested in how big your muscles are. Ladies aren't really interested in how many push-ups you can do. And this idea goes away, and as part of your identity, it disappears. It's not part of you anymore. You're not running to the gym anymore and doing push-ups and doing pull-ups. Ideas change over time. People develop. And this process of identity formation, basically summarized, is that. Another way to look at it, though, also is that your identity is formed not just by who you are, but by those groups that you affiliate with and by those, that, those different ways in which you identify yourself. Just to read that formal uh, definition for you, identity formation is the development of a distinct personality of an individual. Pieces of a person's identity include a sense of uniqueness from others and a sense of affiliation. So you have that sense of being unique and that sense of being affiliated and part of a group. And the pros, this process defines individuals to others and themselves. So this evening we want to discuss this idea of self-concept very quickly so that we can move on inshallah and get to the meat of our discussion quicker and faster. You know another way to look at self-concept or the things that make your self-concept is, for instance, you have those things like self-esteem, the stability of your self-concept and the efficiency of your own efficiency, how you conceive of your efficiency in your self-concept. Self-esteem is the evaluative component. This is the way in which you measure your own worth, where you make judgments about your own self-worth. And comes into this not only looks, but physical characteristics, how you use your hands, Different things build up a person's self-esteem. Stability refer, refers to the organization and continuity of one's self-concept. 
that the way you conceive yourself remains stable throughout your life. They have a, they have a word for people who cannot maintain a stable self-concept. Schizophrenics. A schizophrenic, a person who sees himself differently at different times, in very drastic cases, sees himself as different persons even at different times, their self-concept has no stability. And so therefore, they're suffering with that illness. Stability refers to the organization and continuity of one's self-concept. And it is, is it in constant flux or uh, is it stable? Can a singular, relatively trivial event drastically affect one's emotional uh, stability? And if this is the case, then you can see that that person is not very stable at all. And self-efficacy is best ex ex explained as self-confidence. It is specifically connected with one's abilities, unlike self-esteem. Now there's a debate amongst these sociologists and psyche, psyche, psychiatrists and psychologists as to when one's self-concept and identity forms. Like I said earlier, some of them say as early as age three, a child has an idea of who they are. Others say, nah, it's too early at age three. They say by age seven or eight, a child, by that time, they're able to understand their own emotions, understand their own feelings, and interpret them. And so by age seven or eight, then they have a very clear idea of who they are and what their identity is. Now, one thing that this, these psychologists and uh, sociologists point out is that one very important factor in a child's developing identity is the parents. The parents are completely, like, have direct influence in the development of their children's identity. Some of these sociologists and psychologists go so far as to say, look, and we in Islam, we know this to be the truth, but they say, they go so far as to say, look, that even the parents' own self-concept, their own identity, their own psychological problems, their own issues that they may have, can be understood by the children. That the children can see that something's wrong with daddy, or something's wrong with mommy, and this can also influence their identity the way they conceive of themselves. Mothers and fathers' personal habits also have to play in this. And one thing we have to mention, you've heard me mention it here on numerous occasions before, parents don't just think that your kids inherit physical characteristics from you. That you're just going to pass on physical characteristics, eyes and nose and mouth and height, hair color, eye color, so on. Also, children inherit spiritual characteristics from their parents. So, any weaknesses in our spirituality, in our practice of the deen, can affect our children. This is why you see in Islam, there's so many recommendations that should be followed. Just from the beginning, looking for a wife, looking for a husband, there's recommendations that should be followed. When you're married, and on that first night of the marriage, there's so many recommendations that should be followed, du'as that should be said, salat that should be made, so on and so forth. During pregnancy, so many recommendations. When the mother is breastfeeding, they say, mothers, you should always breastfeed in wudu. Does the wudu change the flavor of the milk? Does it turn regular milk into Nestle quick strawberry milk? If they make wudu, no. Nothing special happens when they make the wudu. So why is it recommended then? Because all of these things, and we should remember this especially as parents, what you feed your children has an effect on them. You give them halal or halam, it has an effect on them. If you give them milk from the mother's breast when she has wudu, it has an effect on them. Spiritual characteristics are inherited also from our parents and passed down also. And this is part of our identity too. So it's not just that the parents have a responsibility towards their children physically, but also spiritually. And we see that Islam has laid out a number of guidelines, too numerous for us to go into really 
in raising children. 